I think the, the whole story of the Texas Rangers getting to Arlington, Texas initially is still a fascinating one. Uh, you know, more than 50 years later now, and it really is all to do with a young mayor from Arlington, Texas, by the name of Tom Vandergriff, who basically in the 60s had a vision to bring Major League Baseball to Arlington. Arlington had less than 50,000 people, but the mayor had big visions. He got General Motors to build a plant here. He got Six Flags over Texas to build an amusement park here. And he spent most of the 1960s trying to find a major league franchise that would move to Arlington. The A's, the Cleveland Indians, after lots of misses, he connected with the Washington Senators owner, Bob Short. And the story is the Minnesota Twins were the original Washington Senators. They'd been in Washington since 1901. Uh, they moved to Minneapolis after the 1960 season. There was so much pressure by politicians and everything to put a team back in the nation's capital that the wa expansion Washington Senators were formed and started to play in 1961. They were horrendous. And so Short's attendance was going this way uh, his financial bank accounts were going this way, and he was open to a move uh, of his franchise against a lot of opposition, including the president of the United States at the time, Richard Nixon. And there's a famous story that he sent his son-in-law, David Eisenhower, to RFK Stadium to talk to Short, and it just happened that, that Tom Vandergriff was there meeting with Short when David Eisenhower showed up, and... Uh, Robert Short told Vandergriff, look, he can't see you here. So he, he put him in a closet in his office. Uh, and David Eisenhower came in, made an impassioned plea from President Nixon on September 21st, 1971, by a 10 to 2 vote, uh, the American League owners voted to move uh, the Washington Senators to Arlington. He used baseball to bring Dallas and Fort Worth together. Texas Rangers played their first game in Arlington on April 21st, uh, 1972. It was the vision of a young mayor uh, to bring the franchise here. There were good years mixed in and, in and out. I mean, the first two years here were not good. Uh, it's amazing. They had two Hall of Fame managers in the first year. Ted Williams managed here in 72. And then they hired again a young Whitey Herzog to manage here in 73, uh, fired him. Short hires Billy Martin and the great turnaround gang, as we call it, of uh, 1974. They finished second. Uh, Ferguson Jenkins won a club record that, that remains to this day, 25 games. Uh, Jeff Burroughs was the most valuable player. They had a young Jim Sunberg, a young Mike Hargrove, who was Rookie of the Year. They came close a couple of times in the late 70s. We went to the, into the early 80s again. 19, 1986, under Bobby Valentine, we finished second. A lot of good players came through here in, in that decade. And that kind of led us into those late 80s where uh, in the, in the, at the fall of winter meetings of 1988 in Atlanta, the general manager, Tom Grieve, kind of remade the club. Coming off a mediocre season, the general manager at the time, Tom Grieve, decided we needed both offense and pitching. So he traded for two all-stars, first baseman Rafael Palmero and second baseman Julio Franco. And that in itself would have been a great winter meetings for the Rangers. But on the final day of the winter meetings, we signed Nolan Ryan to basically a one-year contract with an option for 1990. And that really did change the whole growth, momentum of the franchise, if you will. And it started in the first month of the 1989 season in April. Nolan took three no-hitters into the eighth inning, including one into the ninth, and the excitement just, just built from there. He had his 5,000 strikeout in August of that year, which was really the first major national media event for a Rangers team. 
The Rangers were never much of a national story prior to that time. But having Nolan Ryan, and every time he pitched, you didn't know what you were going to get. No hitter was always a chance, especially that first couple of years he was here. He struck out 301 batters uh, in 1989 uh, at the age of 42, which was phenomenal. And at the same time, we were going through an ownership change prior to the 89 season. Uh, Eddie Childs sold the club to a, a group led by, later to be president of the United States, George W. Bush. George Bush's father at the time was in the White House. I think that was kind of exciting for everybody here. And like I said, it just took off. 1989, 1990 especially, Nolan had remarkable seasons. He ended up pitching here five years. And during that time, October of 1990, we announced the agreement with the city of Arlington to build a new stadium, which became the ballpark in Arlington and opened in April of 1994. I don't know if that ballpark would have ever been built if we had not signed Nolan Ryan. It gave us the wherewithal and it raised our attendance. And I think it showed the city too how much we needed a new ballpark. Arlington Stadium had 22,000 bleacher seats and those were $4 seats. So when Nolan pitched, a sellout was worth $88,000 to us. So we needed a new ballpark to kind of create the revenue streams so we could compete you know, in the American League going forward. It's kind of uh, ironic. Nolan retired after the 1993 season, that last September when we played our final game in Arlington Stadium and then moved into what was considered at the time one of the most beautiful ballparks in the American League, the ballpark in Arlington. So we opened the, the ballpark in Arlington in April of 1994. Not a momentous year in the history of Major League Baseball. There was a player strike in August of that year that wiped out the World Series for the first time in 94 years. But then in 1995, we hired Johnny Oates, who had been the manager of the Orioles. And that kind of changed everything. Johnny was able to lead a club that had had a talent. We had had a lot of success in Latin America signing players, specifically Ruben Sierra in the late 80s, early 90s. And then of course, the two big cornerstones, Juan Gonzalez and uh, Ivan Rodriguez. And we had a lot of talent, but it was Johnny who came in uh, and kind of blended that talent together. We went out and made some, uh, some really good trades and free agent signings to turn it into a real club. And for the first time in history, you had a real team. Played together, played their hearts out. We signed Will Clark, which was a big part of that. And it led to, in 1996, they finally advanced to the playoffs. The Rangers won the American League West. Not easy. We had a nine game lead at one point in September that, that went all the way to one game. But we able, were able to hang on. And uh, Juan Gonzalez was the most valuable player. Uh, we beat the Yankees uh, in the first game of the uh, American League Division Series on a complete game by John Burkett at Yankee Stadium and then got swept and lost the last three games. Yankees went on to win the World Series and that was the same kind of refrain for us in 1998, 1999. We just, we had really good re regular seasons uh, led by Gonzalez, who won a second MVP in 1998. Uh, Rodriguez, who won the MVP in 1999. And uh, quickly out of the playoffs by, again, bad luck. Those were some of the more dominant Yankee teams since the 1950s, probably. Uh, but again, it, it showed that we, could, that we had competitive championship baseball here in Ireland. You know, after losing to the Yankees three times in four years, uh, the owner at the time, Tom Hicks, he made a dramatic free agent signing at the winter meetings 
right here in Dallas in December of 2000 when he signed Alex Rodriguez to a 10-year contract worth $252 million. And it blew away anything that had happened before that. And it created, initially created a lot of excitement. The three years he played here, 2001, two, and three, probably the three best individual years in team history. Played every day. Uh, he hit 57 home runs one year, which is the club record to this day. He won the Most Valuable Player Award in 2003 when the club finished last. But ultimately, we didn't have the resources to pay one player that kind of money, and it resulted basically in three last place finishes. Rodriguez was traded after the 2003 season to the Yankees, and a period of rebuilding eventually began. John Daniels came in as the general manager in 2006 at the age of 28, and began to build up the farm system, so that by the latter part of that decade, you started to have good young players being developed. Michael Young, uh, Ian Kinsler, uh, Mark Teixeira. And then the defining trade, well, two defining trades, I guess. At the, at the um, trade deadline 2007, Teixeira is traded to Atlanta for a haul that brings back Naftali Feliz, Elvis Andrus, Matt Harrison, among other players, all became cornerstones of the team's that would go on to the World Series. And then, of course, the trade with Cincinnati in December of that year that brought Josh Hamilton here as really the, the catalyst of those teams. In a lot of ways, it reminded me of those teams in the late 90s. It was a great nucleus of players that worked well together under a, a manager that led a very steady hand in Ron Washington and you saw the, the seeds of it a little bit in 2009, and then 2010, 2011, the Rangers went back-to-back -back American League pennants, and you felt like you did back in 1996 when Feliz struck out Alex Rodriguez for the final out against the hated New York Yankees here in game six of the ALCS in 2010 at then what was called Rangers Ballpark in Arlington. I had neighbors that cried who had been Ranger fans for ever. Hamilton wins the Most Valuable Player Award. Uh, you know, the, uh, Feliz is Rookie of the Year. Um, lost to the Giants in five games, but the next year we had an even better team. Put the Tigers and uh, out of their misery and the Championship Series again at the Ranger Ballpark in Arlington, and then had a very dramatic seven-game World Series against the St. Louis Cardinals, where the Rangers were twice uh, one strike away from, from winning their first World Championship in Game 6. It was not meant to be. 2010, 11, and 12, probably the three best teams in, in Rangers history, and the 12 team just ran out of gas. They had signed you Darvish. Um, last year, you know, Hamilton was still here. And after that season, Hamilton became a free agent. We traded Michael Young. And again, you were going back to a little bit of rebuilding there. Get a little resurgence in 15 and 16 with back-to-back -back, uh, division titles. Lost to the Blue Jays both years in the division series. But the period from 2010 to 2016, you know, over a sustained period of time, the Texas Rangers were one of the best teams in Major League Baseball. So after the 2016 team, which won 95 games, things were a little lean at the end of that decade and then early into the, into the next decade. But at the same time, um, you had the momentum to again build another new ballpark. The original ballpark in Arlington, now called at this point Globe Life Park in Arlington, Rangers only played there for 26 years. But very much like Arlington Stadium, 
you know, times have changed in baseball and the way fans viewed the game, it became more and more difficult to play in North Texas uh, in a ballpark without a roof. Momentum started, the election passed in, the, in November of 2016 to build a new ballpark that would have a retractable roof, it would not only be a, a ballpark that would be a home of the Rangers, but would be a, a facility where you could do events year round. It became more of a multi-purpose facility. It was a much different situation than it was in the old ballpark. When we built the ballpark in Arlington, we're building a traditional baseball stadium. Real grass, open air stadium, which, you know, again, I think was partly cost related at the time. Retractable roofs in the early 90s were, were very expensive and, and the money wasn't there. But here in, in the late 2016, you know, when, when it's passed, the momentum again created in terms of, of this ballpark and it was gorgeous when it opened. In terms of the team, it, we were in a difficult situation. It was a time we probably should have rebuilt. We tried to sustain the success of 2015, 2016 because we were getting ready to move into a new ballpark. Didn't really work out that way. Really kind of punctuated by the fact that the ball, uh, Globe Life Field, the new ballpark, was scheduled to open in March of 2020. We had a great media event in this park on March 11th of that year. That night, the NBA suspended play. And we obviously, the, the start of the Major League season was canceled. Uh, we finally were able to play games in here in late July in front of what we call Doppel Rangers, which were cardboard cutouts. It was obviously a very disappointing opening that we had expected to a new ballpark. Did not play well in a 60-game season. We was finally able to have some excitement there at the end of the year when, when the park hosted a neutral postseason. We had the National League Division Series the National League Championship Series between the Braves and the Dodgers, and then the World Series between uh, the Dodgers and the Tampa Bay Rays. That was the only time in the 2020 season where fans were allowed at all in a major league park. There was a limited attendance for both the NLCS and the World Series. So our big opening was then in 21. At the same time, you had more growth in the area, uh, new hotels, Texas Live, a lot of development, and Globe Life Field has been able to be kind of the fulcrum for the develop around it. We're bringing new events here. In November of 2022, Major League Baseball awarded this, the franchise, the 2024 All-Star Game, where we're going to be able to utilize this entire area for the, all the events around the All-Star Game, as opposed to having to do events in Fort Worth and Dallas. This will be the mecca of baseball in July of, of 2024. And hopefully, consequently, you know, we, the team has showed signs of starting to come back. Uh, the signings uh, in December of 2021 of Marcus Simeon and Corey Seager to long-term contracts, I think showed a commitment by ownership that they were willing to put the resources into the park. Uh, we have a dynamic new general manager and Chris Young has taken over the baseball operations. And I think the team at that point has started to go in the right direction.